welcome to the STOA. My name is Raven and we are joined today by James Ellis, also known as Meta Nomad, for a 90 minute session on his book, Exiting Modernity. So I'm really excited for this uh, presentation today. It's wonderful to see everybody. Um, I'm back to, to MC this event and I'm super excited about it. I've been listening to James's podcast for two or more years now. It's a uh, hermetics and it's about obscure philosophy and um, all sorts of the topics that I'm sure he'll be covering today. So go ahead and th start throwing your questions or comments in the chat um, so that we can answer them in the last half hour of the session. And yes, this, was, this session will be going for about 90 minutes, just a FYI for everybody. All right, and with that, uh, I'll turn it over to, to James and uh, you can start giving us your presentation about your book. Just make sure you're unmuted before you start chatting. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, originally I was, uh, I was uh, you know, thanks for everyone for turning up and uh, taking the time to sort of listen to me. Um, not so much ramble, but riff on my, on my book, which itself is this collection of essays about, in short, why the modern world isn't all it's cracked up to be, um, which is a topic that a lot of people cover generally. Um, but as I was sort of saying to, to Peter and Raven before we started, I was asked to do a presentation on, uh, you know, like a, a PowerPoint presentation with slides and quotes and all this professional fancy stuff. And I did try to create one. And I realized really that I couldn't formalize what it is I wanted to say because the book itself was written as a collection of essays over over years really and was basically uh <laughs> it's uh it's a really tough book to explain I don't want to like pick it up to be more than it is because I personally I do think that it just holds a very small space uh which is needed in a certain time I don't think it's gonna stand the test of time I don't think it's anything amazing uh, I just think it's a collection of essays which a lot of people um like myself needed now I don't really want to talk about myself all that much um I have a bachelor's in fine art. Uh, I went on to do a master's in continental philosophy. Um, I also don't really hold those credentials in high esteem at all. And they're basically meaningless to me, but they've allowed me to enter into certain avenues in life, almost as sort of checkboxes. Um, other than that, I run Hermetics podcast and that is now my full-time job. And I've run that podcast for um, three years now and um, it's getting uh, pretty big. Um, so, you know, it's there if, you, if you're into fringe philosophy and things like that. So that's pretty much all it is about me. Other bits of my biography will probably come in as I continue to give this chat. Now, I, I'll just get into the bulk of what we're talking about, which is exiting modernity and the idea of exiting modernity. So exiting modernity, what is that? Basically talking about <laughs> exiting the modern world. Why would you want to exit it? Why is it so bad? Uh, really, I have to start this discussion from um, a, a story when I was working in marketing, which is basically the first uh, essay in the book, which begins from the real exiting modernity stuff, which is called Eating Tuna from the Tin. And I will just um, sort of say something before getting in that I don't really consider this a philosophical book. I don't think it's anything super, super deep. Uh, but a person who I used to, who really inspired me to write many years ago, who I never even knew his real name is just a guy called Nishiki Prestige basically said to me that some of the ideas that you have throughout life that you think are absolutely blindingly obvious um, really aren't to many other people and could really help them in some way and that basically got me writing and then from the first time I wrote something I realized that actually that there's some real truth to that that something that you find to be so absolutely obvious to some people could be a real help to them and really help them sort of expand their horizon. So as I say, um, I was in a, a marketing job, which was one of those jobs where you're paid to work for eight hours a day, but really you do about 30 minutes real work and the rest of it is just a staring at a screen um, and pretending that you're doing something in some quantifiable sense, which is what most jobs I believe are these days. Um, but anyway, that job was okay and I don't want to downplay, you know, the people there were very nice and blah, blah, blah. But it was just one of these filler make work jobs, which most people do. Anyway, the job isn't the point. I mean, we'll probably come back to the, my, my experience in marketing at some point. The point was at the end of the day, 
and this was about this would have been 2017 end of 2017 start of 2018 at the end of the day uh, like four times a week I uh, would go to the gym after work and before I go to the gym I'd want a snack um, and I would always eat a can of tuna uh, straight from the tin just open the tin and then just eat it with a fork and uh, I did this like three times in a in a row and, I, I, and like like I know this isn't real big stuff this isn't serious stuff but I would just eat that and my boss one day he sort of almost took me aside and he said like what's going on and I was like sorry what do you mean he's like why'd you do it like that and I was like I don't know I like the whole frame of reference was so far apart that I couldn't really relate to him and I don't mean that in any pretentious way I don't think I was superior anyway or anything like that but I just completely could not understand what he's on about he's like why'd you eat the tuna like straight from the tin and I was like well I just need to snack before I go to the gym and he's like why don't you put it between bread and have a sandwich and I was like well I just yeah but I just want the tuna and this conversation probably went on for like 30 minutes right the whole point with me is I just need but this really simple um, scenario basically opened up the whole world of exiting modernity to me, to me that this man who is a really nice guy and I think he sort of uh, resembles your average person, I realized in that moment was clinging to a, just an absolute mass of unspoken, unconscious ideas of what is completely normal. And they really um, completely framed any 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 worldview that he had and I mean another example is basically that like I one question I sort of ask people to open up this these ideas is why do you sleep on a bed and the the general answer is like well uh um well you just do right you just do you just you just sleep on a bed that's just what we do actually there's tons of places in the world where people don't sleep on a bed even modern Western places, plenty of people in Japan sleep, sleep on the floor or sleep on futons. I'm not like pushing any particular way of life. I'm just saying that there's a huge set of assumptions which are already there for us, which completely restrict how we feel and how we experience life, which then eventually led me to write a small piece called um, uh, uh, The Gl uh, Global Lobotomy. Um, I actually have to remember the name, avoiding the global lobotomy. Sorry, I had to remember the name of my own piece there. Right, and the point was that I was trying to make is that I don't want to underplay what a lobotomy is. Right? A lobotomy is this very serious procedure, which for people who are very sick. But the definition of a lobotomy is um, reducing, it, it's done to reduce the complexity of psychic life, right? That's why you have a lobotomy is so life isn't so like full on. Now, I was basically realized that most people have been somewhat lobotomized on a psychological way. I list like a ton of things which I think most people are feeling um, and people, this has been my most popular um, thing that I've written. Um, it sort of feels like there's a sort of a two inch thick shell of gunk around your brain. You have light brain fog. You like have difficulty remembering anything, even like what you had for dinner yesterday. You can't really keep up with anything that's going on. You just like in a very minor, minute present for like a second. And then all of a sudden everything's just gone. You're on the next thing. Uh, your, con your concentration has been absolutely fried. Uh, you're just sort of drifting. There's no real stimulus. You feel absolutely no vital connection to life. Like you're completely unanchored. You're always mentally tired. You sort of feel like you're going mad and all your emotions and feelings have become somewhat dampened, right? Now, of course, I'm not a doctor and I'm not like a psychologist, but a lot of people I spoke to felt that way, but it's not to such an extent that you, um, you would do anything about it, right? You're just like, well, that's just how life is. But basically my whole point was like, yeah, actually that isn't, that isn't how life, life is and it can be way better. So I began writing these articles about just very simple things that you could practice or do or realize about the world which may help you somewhat exit it now to sort of outline what i mean by this i'll take a quote um by john michael greer uh, from an article called called the butlerian carnival and he says for most people in today's america in other words the closest approach to the glorious consumer's paradise of the future they can expect to get is eight hours a day five days a week of mindless monotonous work under constant pressure of management efficiency experts, if they're lucky enough to get a job at all, with anything up to a couple of additional hours commuting and any off-book hours the employer happens to choose and demand from them into the deal. In order to get a paycheck that buys less and less every week, 
uh, because inflation is under control, the government insists, but prices keep going up, uh, of products which keep getting more cheaply made and are likely to be riddled with more defects and likely to pose a serious threat to the health and well-being of their users with every passing year. They can go home and numb their nervous systems with those little colored pictures on the screen, showing them bland little snippets of experiences they will never have wedged in between some advertising. That's the world that progress is made. Now, all right, that's pretty pessimistic. It's pretty bleak. Um, I get that. Um, and I don't, this was the thing, I don't want to push this at all. Hence why, well, how do you get out, how do you get out of this, right? People have been going on about this for years. People have been going on about this reality, which everyone does. Uh, everyone can see the, all right, we'll get up at seven, uh, you know, get up at six or seven because I've got an hour commute in a car that I only have and only pay for so I can get to the job, which is a job that I don't really enjoy. And then I work there for about eight hours and we have lunch for 30 minutes, which I have to wolf down with a load of people that I wouldn't normally hang out with, but I have to because of this convenience. I'm doing all of this to pay for a house of which I desire for reasons I don't really know. And the house's location is in a certain place which is close enough to the job so it's easy to get to the job. So basically every single thing in your life just revolves around this consumptive loop now don't get me wrong right you you've got to eat capitalism sucks right i'm not like some uber leftist anti-capitalist i'm not that but on the same hand on the same on the same thing it's like well render unto caesar right these are the realities my point is really in between that there's a way to there is a way to live within the modern world which isn't complete submission to this sort of leviathan behemoth um and still you're, you're allowed to sort of retain some individual freedom, uh, more, more so than, 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 than I think most people think is possible. And for me, the whole point was that this really a mental reframing of everything that's going on. Um, and that, that is the key. So because a lot of people who generally want to sort of try exit the world, modern world, or want to do something new, they want to have this huge rebellion and they want to smash everything. And I wouldn't say that my pieces are like a complacency of like, oh, that's there. Like, you've just got to deal with it. I'd say basically say that we all know that's there, but what is it that you unconsciously agree to in terms of like desires, once again, with the house thing, the car thing, the job thing, um, that actually you could change if only you had a mental way of reframing what reality is. Back to like the idea of eating tuna from the tin, which seems like a very simple idea. But when you expand it out, it's basically the idea of that there's a ton of possibilities out there that you wouldn't really accept or connect with because they just seem absurd in the face of what's accepted in terms of status, popularity, et cetera. So where does this all begin? Um, as you'd imagine, and I, I, you know, I'm really open for people to disagree with me on this. It all begins with school, uh, Western schooling in particular, which really is a glorified babysitting service. I can't really think back to anything in school, which I, like I actually sort of learned. Um, I went to a public school and it was just sort of lessons that would, I don't know, just in a room for a bit. That's when I think back to school and I think about like, if you generally ask someone like, what did you actually learn in school? I was just sat in a room under fluorescent lighting being told what to do. I can't really remember any strict lessons that I, that I learned in school. Like, I, I probably learned some maths, maybe, uh, maybe some English, like we read some stuff at some point and I got like straight straight B's literally I got B's and everything I was a real underachiever as like wouldn't surprise you at all um but one of the things um that that school teaches the, you that you don't realize is um to do with freedom so when you first start school when you're I don't know I guess in the UK what is it like three or four in reception what we call reception you have like tons of restrictions I told they tell you what you can wear obviously with uniform they tell you when you can eat when you can drink when you can go to the loo uh and and when you're young when you're younger it's like way more restrictions as well like even probably what you can talk about what you can even do etc and as you grow and as you go through the years they they remove they slowly remove restrictions right so you're like oh man i'm growing up i'm getting freer this is great like more freedom and by the time you get to college oh, Oh my God, you can actually wear what you want to wear. And this, this isn't seem like, this isn't seen as like an absurdity that you're allowed to just wear what you wear. This is like, oh yeah, well, of course we've got freedom now. And then you get to university, you get more freedom. Now this all seems great. And all, you know, people can easily defend this. Like, well, obviously when you're younger, you need restrictions. But the point is, a problem with this is, is that when you finish school, it seems as if the world that you enter into 
is like the absolute pinnacle of freedom. It's like, oh, I finally finished school, like I'm completely free. And you never really learn what real freedom is because school is there to, to give you all these restrictions to basically think that what comes after school is like complete and utter freedom, when it actually isn't. And people sort of adore the freedom that comes after school. They start talking about like, um, almost in it with enjoyment, they start talking about like paying taxes and I don't know, things like that, like mortgages and taxes and really boring stuff that is just absolutely dead. Now, what school really taught you in retrospect is basically how to do extremely absurd stuff. And in short, in my real honest opinion, school taught you how to internalize years and years of trauma. That's basically all it did. And what I mean by that is when you begin to objectively look at what school is, it's someone who wants to be free, hopefully, who, who's got a real vital energy, a real creative spirit, not to be too pretentious, who is made to sit in a room for eight hours, eight hour stints under fluorescent lights, sitting completely still and being told exactly what to do. And all school really teaches you throughout all the years of it is how to inter internalize that behavior as completely normal, right? It's to, it's to teach you to never to question the office work, which is you go into this room and you sit within like a three foot by three foot box staring at a 30 inch screen for years, right? And if you if you can mentally take the, the objective step back and look at that, it's like an absolute gut punch, right? And if you can really step back and just, you know, of all the possibilities and potential and horizons in life, you take this step back and you look at a human being who walks into this, does the same commute, you know, they get into their little box, they do the same two hour or one hour commute every day, they walk like a hundred meters up to their office and then they get into that same, little bit that they're in all day and then they just look in one direction out of the whole universe out of all possibilities that could possibly happen for human beings we've ended up in a position where people are just sat in spaces looking forward basically doing nothing i mean anyone here who's worked in in marketing jobs or office jobs it's like here's some numbers to push around make it look like you've done stuff right there's very very little actual productivity happening in these places um, and 99% and of this could be automated just to throw something in there the irony is that of all the jobs they could automate with all their fancy AI stuff they automated trucking right they didn't automate banking right which there's a there's a huge argument to be had that there's a huge class thing there right of all the things like what what's banking what's insurance you put in some details and it and and what some human pretends to like you for a bit right it's ridiculous anyway of all the possibilities in life we've come to internalize what I consider to be quite a traumatic thing as completely and utterly normal and not see it as absurd that this is how we spend our lives. Now, of course, the rebuttal against this is, oh, dude, I've got to eat. Right? And I get that. I can sympathize with that. We've all got to eat. We've all got to have a roof over our heads. We've all got to uh, find a way to basically still exist. But the, 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 the problem that we find ourselves in is that the, 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 the real meaning that we used to have for life, which was sort of some sense of survival right you need you need shelter water and and food in that order these things are fairly easy to come by right and i once wrote a piece about the fact that actually in many western countries human meaning like the real meaning of trying to be alive and trying to um exist in some sense of connection to what it actually is to stay alive and be alive and be a human being has been so utterly de destroyed and deconstructed that you could actually lay down right in most western countries you could just lay down and do nothing and you literally wouldn't die because within like a day some people would come along and carry you somewhere where you 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 know you'd be taken to hospital right now i'm not trying to undermine that whole system but it is absurd that that would happen that you 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 actually we've got to a state where human meaning and human life is so meaningless that you could just be like you know what i'm just going to lay down and and nothing will happen right nothing nothing will happen to me there's no there's no point i mean that's complete and pure nihilism so it's sort of my writing is an attempt to try basically to re-enchant existence to the point where you no longer feel that underlying, like, why am I even bothering to do this anymore? Because we, we all know this is fake. Now, I sort of had a hope that with COVID, we had this like very brief shock where basically everyone stared right blank in the face of, damn, we've all just accepted that this is complete rubbish, right? We, we've all realized this, right? They, they all of a sudden like, oh yeah, we could, we could have all worked from home like all along and everybody who's working from home is then finally doing the amount of work that like they no longer have to pretend to work right that that that's what's happening when people are at home so and i was like oh, please can this be the shock which basically wakes people up to like 
yeah, we can just we can we, we can just live like we no longer need to pretend that we need to work anymore. But it didn't happen actually. What happened was the complete opposite, and it was really worrying, really quite harrowing that all these people are like were saying, "Oh yeah, we um we uh we'll get to work from home, blah blah blah." People will really petition to stay working at home, and actually, loads of people really wanted to go back to normality. Loads of people really craved going back to the office. They craved that 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 comfort of that life and it seemed to be like a self-willed restriction um so just i mean i guess i'm sort of somewhat halfway through my speech which is a load of just different things i'm trying to cobble together so the the, the i'll try now in this this second half to because i hate writers and i hate pretty much all philosophers because of the fact that they don't give any answers right um I, I think that's too long not said, right? People study philosophy, they study these theorists. And I think it's a real tyranny to interject a question and not at least try to attend to the answer. It's very easy to say, you know, it's, it's super easy, in fact, to go, oh yeah, the modern world sucks, man. That like, oh, yeah, we're just wage slaves and this is awful and this is all programmed rubbish, right? That's super easy. People have been doing that for years since the start of the industrial revolution. What is harder and I think and more difficult is basically to sincerely say, well, here's something you could do. Um, so the first thing really is to is to take a sort of for me is to to the, the best definition of freedom that I think there is, is is really to do with where you aren't free. So the best definition of freedom I've heard is to what extent can you immediately alter your immediate environment? Right. Like. Like, for instance, I have a wooden uh, shelving unit next to me. Now, I was a joiner for like a year. So I actually have the freedom to be able to alter that and deal with it. Uh, I could probably like, I can, I know I can, I built my PC, so I could mess around with that. But then when it comes to a lot of other things, I actually have no freedom. I'm completely reliant on a ton of other restrictions because I have absolutely no clue what is going on in my immediate surroundings. I have, I have no clue how most of this stuff works. I, I click a button online and things arrive, right? So there's there's an extent of... This is something also school taught you implicitly, which many people don't realize is the, 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 the almost the fetishization of credentialism, right? That if people aren't credentialed and people don't have the degrees and the, the certificates, then people have this real like gut level worry that they won't be able to do it. And I always try to explain to people like, and maybe don't go out and do some stuff because ultimately some stuff is dangerous, right? But ultimately, if two people do the exact same course and have the exact same knowledge, but one of them has the degree or the credential and the other one doesn't, there is no real difference, but we believe there is. So in terms of like people fixing their cars or fixing appliances or fixing up their home, people get really worried that they're going to do something wrong as if that within a credential, there is something which magically means that they're, they're able to do it um, better than, you know, like they're able to do it. Like they've got some implicit magic because of this credential, which is just basically ridiculous. So the real the real way to exit modernity really is basically to to not offload all your responsibility onto some sort of abstract other, which is the modern world, and begin to sort of try build up some self agency, which is a really like easy thing to see to say, and 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 to sort of well, how do you begin to do that? And it's one way is to begin to question your consumptive habits and question what it is you believe, and uh, you know, like going back to the tin of tuna is to question like, well, why why don't I just eat simple meals, or why don't I I don't know like I've always given the example of like skipping to the store not that I do that myself but like we would see that as an absurd thing but it's completely within the realm of possibility and freedom for people to do that but they don't so there's a lot of things like that that you could just live your life in a different way but the quote that um hit me the hardest at one point uh, was when I was interviewing a, a, a sort of collapse author called Dmitry Orlov and he said um that if you think about the, the average person in the Western world these days, most of them are, if you remove their vices and their consumption habits, you really wouldn't have much left, which is a fairly bleak thing to think about. But it's also something to think about in terms of yourself. You know, a lot of people say, well, what are you into? Well, I like going out and I like having cocktails and I like going on holiday and I'm really into uh, soap operas and, and I really like these authors. And then you slowly remove all these things which they've attached to them as like third party things which they've built up their identity from you go okay but other than the things which you haven't created and that you have to do to feel alive like all right but who are you like what why are you and um you know even myself i'm not I, i'm not much more than that um and, and most people aren't because it's sort of a constant the, the modern world is a constant escape and it always makes me go back to the the quote by pascal which is that 
most of man's problems could be solved just by sitting in a room in silence for five minutes. But people can't do that. People can't be silent for five seconds, let alone five minutes. Um, so basically, this, this commodification of identity is a really difficult problem. Uh, all identities are commodified, even to the extent of having a beard is commodified or anything's commodified. And it's, uh, it's, it's basically the, the idea that you don't take yourself, that the modern world is really pushes the idea that you don't take yourself with you when you do things like when you're reading a book even that, like you're going somewhere else and people think like that's somehow changing you in some sense that you're something other right and people always push this with like oh i'm gonna go traveling to find myself so you you, you do you do realize you took yourself with you you can't escape yourself you need to be able to deal with yourself in that way the whole point you're going is to try and find yourself whereas like you, you can't escape the cell of yourself so you need to be able to deal with that um you're always in your own cell so this is like this is really where it all began from is is basically this just accepting to the accepting the 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 mind-numbing bleakness of of modernity and having the goal to try attempts to re-enchant it in some sense and i don't think it's disenchanted but i think that most things we do in it are disenchanted and i think there's a lot of avenues out there and a lot of people doing things which can re-enchant the world um but they they're sometimes um, quite difficult to find and sometimes people don't want to and most of it really is a, a form of escapism and it's I feel like this is really perhaps this is where I should finish up on the idea of what it is when people have a mental breakdown um, because I don't think a mental I've, I've known a few people who've had mental breakdowns um, as you probably imagine I, that's probably like doesn't surprise you I don't think I've had one. I think maybe I've been have I've had one which has just been drawn out, so it hasn't been so intense, like a five year long mental breakdown. And I don't think they're bad things. I think really what a mental breakdown is is basically coming uh, two hypocrisies coming coming together, and you you get to this point where you have to absolutely admit something which just you never really really wanted to. It's like an absolute paradox finally has to be dealt with. And I think for most people in the modern world a lot of breakdowns which come about from maybe some sort of real traumatic event are really the, 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 them dealing with this absolute absurdity that this is what we do every day. And, and this is why I sort of emphasize that I don't think my book's anything really like special. It's just sort of meant to be a helping hand. And I articulate these ideas a lot better in the book, I would say. But what I mean by that is that it's been said time and time again that like, there's no other way I can really articulate it other than like, do you guys not see like, this is just completely absurd when you've got these people who are like, for, for me, I guess it's encapsulated in the idea that when I was doing office work and retail work, the idea that I'd, I'd get into work at 8am in the morning and say like, oh, morning, how are you? And most people would reply with like, oh, you know, the same or like, oh, live in the dream. And within that reply is this, there's this absurd acceptance between us all that none of us really want to be doing this, that none of us, are really happy doing this at all like we and we all know it we all accept it and yet none of us really are trying to find ways to deal with it and mine I get uh, uh, the book I guess is meant to be a pragmatic approach of saying unfortunately we do have to deal with it we we need to eat and as I say and it's there to stay like to a, to a degree you have to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's but there is ways to exist in the world which is almost like an internal rebellion against it right and they can't really quash that and that sort of leads me to to the concept which really helped the writing along which is by Ernst Jünger called the Anarch which really is, 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 is was extremely sort of emancipative at the time not in the left-wing way but like to take the difference between the Anarch and the Anarchist like the Anarchist is this person who's like they see they see what's going on in the world they see um, poverty and strife or they see some problems and what do they do they like they get internally involved they take up like a flag and a Molotov and they go out in the world and they, they basically let all these problems absolutely, they just identify with these problems and sort of ruin their life because of them. And the Anarch is completely different. The Anarch isn't this external thing. The Anarch sees what's going on in the world and is like, you know, tr and makes up their mind, but then retreats inwards and tries, and tries to find like an internal way um, to basically deal with that. And the understanding that to no extent is, 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 are my, um, a me sort of entering to the externalities of the modern world that's just going to feed the modern world and it's just going to ruin your life doing that right so these kind of people who perhaps i don't know want to do activism all the time or 
do protests. And I just think the modern world is completely equipped to not care about you, right? It will, it will subsume all your energy up and nothing will come of it, right? I'm only 27, but I've seen, since I've been basically, since I can remember at least, there's been just masses and masses of, of activism and protests. And I remember the news people, there's millions of people in the streets. And I don't mean to be a pessimist, but nothing has ever changed in my lifetime. Not once has any of this like done anything. And I don't mean that in a don't go out and do it. If you want to do it and you want to make a difference, I think there is ways to make a difference. But they're usually on a very local scale. And the best way to make a difference is on the most local scale, which is internally having a mental change towards what it is to be uh, uh, like a good person in, in, in the world. Because it's very easy to offload that responsibility and think, well, I've been to a protest, I've donated to charity, therefore I'm a good person. Whereas, well, actually, do you have like the internal vitality to be a real good person, which is like to actually physically go check on a neighbor? Right. You could all these people who are like donating millions or going to these protests. Would these people also genuinely go and help out some local thing? That's up for you to decide. But the anarch is an extremely helpful term because at once it's against the modern world, but equally it's accepting it. And I think it's very dangerous to be like, forget the modern world, because ultimately, if you forget the modern world, it doesn't care that you forgot it and you'll just end up homeless and destitute and poverty stricken. Like you still got a we still got to work. Like there's never going to be in a state where we, we don't have to work. I think that's a complete um, pipe dream and it's complete utopian nonsense. And ultimately there has to be some form of meaning there and some sort of work to be, to be getting on with. But it's basically maintaining a constantly critical relationship with the, the assumptions that it brings about. Um, but I think uh, I'll probably finish it up there because I, I generally can answer and articulate these things better in Q and A. So I, uh, I hope that ramble hasn't been too, confusing um and i hope all of you quit your jobs tomorrow <laughs> that was that was a great uh it was a great introduction to your thought i think um and i think once we start flowing with questions we'll start to get into like the details of of all the nuances of this um so yeah you can start throwing your questions into the chat and then i'll call in your name and you can have a dialogue with with james but i'll just start off so i think it would be very easy to understand what you're saying as like turning inward to be a task of the mind to mm -hmm. be about thinking to be about like understanding your position in the world as an intellectual project but you've also done some writing about the mind as a tyrant and mm -hmm. actually as a kind of part part of the western kind of framing is understanding life as being a task of the mind so is this intuition that turning inward is a process of uh, being intellectual and intellectualizing experience? Is that in and of itself kind of part of the framework or assumption that we're kind of bringing in that actually limits our own freedom and our experience of living? Okay, that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up. That's my, uh, I think that's the second to last thing I wrote on the, the latest blog. The mind, the mind being a tyrant is a really great thing. Um, the, the, generally, the Western world does emphasize intellectualizing, rationalizing, and logic as like, if it's those things, then it's worth more than other things. But I always take the example of um, Michel Serre when he was, he was a French philosopher and somewhat a philosopher of food, but philosopher, maybe you could say, of experience. And he has the tale of when he was a young man, sat in a, a French courtyard on a lovely sunny day and he explains it's absolutely beautiful beautifully in the book the five senses um uh, and he's a he's a young boy and a, an older sort of wiser gentleman picks two very ripe tomatoes off a off a vine cuts them in half and sprinkles some salt on them and, and gives one to young Michel Set. and he eats it and he says that for the first time in his life the the first tongue which is the tongue of language of description of the mind of intellectualizing couldn't do anything it was completely silent and the second tongue came in because the experience of tasting these tomatoes was it's like well i can't explain it because that's its own thing right it's like people who say you go to an art gallery and you go you you, you sort of there's a painting and then people say to the artist what does it mean it's like look at the thing the experience of looking can't if i wanted to write about it i'd have written about it it's the same people who are like this is why food tv is so tyrannical in a way because you're watching it and you know that 
however much the commentator or the chef is like these scallops like if you could taste the roasted nutty flavor it's like yeah but i can't we all know there's a complete impasse because the experience of tasting it and the experience of intellectualizing it are just completely two different languages which will never be able to communicate with one another so that experience which you're on about raven in terms of not relying on intellectualization with regard to everything is super super important and that sort of evidence-based in intellectualization is is re is really it is tyrannical it sort of tries to overthrow everything it wants to explain everything in its own language which there's so much experience out there that really can't be uh, the west isn't very good with emotions unfortunately we sort of hamstring them or uh, is it the right word we sort of constrain them into intellectualized ideas of what emotions are instead of just experiencing them so um we yeah and, and we sort of equate ourselves with our own emotions but that that is that is super important i mean it's it's the the thing with intellectualization is that it tends to want to quantify everything uh, it tends to want to go like wrap everything up i've got that i've understood that where really the emotions and and the movements and the body are qualitative relationships it's to do with quality not quantity and the western world doesn't really like quality it, it, it's all about yeah as you say intellect into the, the intellect and, and um I, I i guess that's one surefire way to begin exiting is to basically trust your intuitions which aren't intellectual and begin with other other experience but you know and not have not sort of seek to constantly feel like you need to know everything um yeah yeah so i'm, I'm kind of i have a question about like your personal journey here so i imagine mm. that you started in one place where these things maybe weren't so obvious to you and mm. kind of have come to realize these things over having many kinds of experiences do you feel like your way of being alive has qualitatively changed oh yeah i'm way i'm way happier i'm way yeah. more content <laughs> yeah no i was i wasn't miserable i wasn't miserable don't get me wrong I would, I think, um, and I don't, this isn't like self-pity. I don't like to, so I tr these days I try not to indulge in uh, negative emotions all that much. It's just sort of a useless endeavor and it never gets you anywhere. But there certainly was in, the, in that frame of mind before, um, before realizing a lot of these things. Um, I certainly was just in that modern world of self-pity and, um, oh, this is all so miserable. And I think that was probably the pressurizing that to a point where you just think, oh God, like I've, all right, like I don't want to underplay uh I don't want to underplay depression and anxiety people can have that and I have my own opinions on about, about that but there's an extent right there's an extent and I think this is what happened to me so I'll just talk about from my own personal experience there was a point when I was like yeah, all right I've been depressed for a while now and nothing's changed like probably probably time to just not do this anymore and I do think that's a genuine possibility right I do I always use the RD Lang example which I absolutely adore even though I'm not fully on board with everything Lang did and R.D. Lang speaks about depression as a the deepest, darkest cell in the deepest, darkest dungeon, right? And you're in this like horrendous place, but the door's unlocked. And in fact, you've just realized it's open. And everyone's like, you know, someone will come down and be like, dude, the, the, it sucks here. The door's unlocked. Let's go. But what do all Western people do? They go, yeah, but I need to find out how I got here first. I really need to know this room really well, like first. And actually, it's a complete option to be like, oh, you know what, I'm bored of this. I'm really bored of that. And you can sort of begin to notice all the things that tie in with what it is to be mentally in that place. And it, the, thing, the thing is, I do believe it is possible to basically think yourself out of a depression in sense of walking out of that door. But I don't think it's something you're like, all right, you don't just decide to do that. It takes a lot of mental rigor. So for those who are like, oh, just stop being depressed. It sort of is like that. But to, to mentally get to that point takes a lot of... A, a, a lot of um a lot of work but yeah I'm, I'm way happier way more content because there's there's so much riding on the misery of the west which is reliant on basically desires which you never you never actually ever had but were built into you right most desires are basically um an anxiety which is relievable by purchase but you never had that anxiety to to, to start with right i never I like I really like this sweater, but I probably like saw an advert at some point with someone wearing this sweater. And now I'm like, I really want a sweater like that. And then this anxiety comes about and I have to go buy it, which is basically most of the desires. And but th there's real big ones in life, which then 
expound expand out into further misery big ones being a house like and a certain type of house um and i just a tiny digression on that because it, i i it reframed how i think about money houses and freedom and this comes from a writer called jacob lund fisker who wrote early retirement extreme which if you want to find another great exiting modernity book um, I recommend that. But he basically says, on average, right, a, 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 an extra room in your house. If you're looking to buy a house and you're like, I really want that dining room, right? And this looks lovely. He says, on average, an extra room in your house is like $50,000. Convert that to the amount of years that you're going to have to work and then see if it's worth the trade off, right? Is it worth having this dining room that you probably use four times a year for an extra probably like 10 years of work and 10 years of not having freedom? Because it's one of the absolute absurdities of life is people basically grinding their entire lives for this huge, let's say on average, 200 to 300,000 pounds worth of debt for something they don't use. They're at work like eight hours with the commute, which is then like 10 by the time you've settled in, as people say. Then you're, you've got to do all your chores. Then you've got like four hours free. Then you go to bed. So most of your time in your house is spent unconscious. Like, why are you grinding, grinding so hard for something that you, you literally are like just not using? Um, but then, of course, people would say, well, what's the alternative? It's like, I don't know, a caravan or, or I would, you know, there is people, uh, there is people who are attempting to tackle this problem. Um, whether or not they're successful uh, remains to be seen, because I think there's probably a lot of people out there to tackle, take them down. But beginning to see things in that object, objective sense is, uh, is, is super helpful. But you have to push through that sunk cost because there's a lot of sunk cost for myself as well like you know buying into things uh that you just don't need mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cool well congratulations on your <laughs> your transformation <laughs> i love that um that's great we do have a lovely question here we have a couple questions um let's see let's go to nathan do you want to Ask your question to James. Yeah, sure. One second, let me find it. Oh, um, do you see relocating as an important factor in exiting mod modernity? Um, can it be additional to turning inward, or does it just satisfy some sort of escapism? Um, it's really tough to answer that because I've never, I've never been able. I've been, I've lived in the UK my whole life and I've been to London three times and they are probably three of the worst experiences in my life and I can't I uh people anyone who says they like London I just think you're a compulsive liar it's absolutely awful uh, and I've been to other cities the Birmingham that's dreadful as well Leeds is dreadful I don't like cities I just think um I don't think they're they're really not natural places and and for very clear reasons that if you go to a city you you, you look around and you can't see anywhere where things are being grown or built which would actually sustain human life right and I don't like to be anywhere where I'm this sounds this almost sounds like Samwise Gamgee from the Shire which I would sort of say is my like spiritual you know I don't know idol <laughs> but I probably don't like to be anywhere where I'm not within like five miles of a farm because I don't think that's reality and I don't have some sort of LARP or like uh almost like fetishization for that sort of cottage core traditional way of living. I think you can live, live as you like, live as you want to. But ultimately, I think the, the statistics show that there's like it within and within a city, there is a week's worth of food, which I, don't, I just think it just doesn't seem real to me. Um, whether or not that, whether or not um, that to, to, to sort of change that, turn that question on its head. I do think it's possible to exit modernity and be in a city because it is an internal thing the the upkeep of that would be way more exhausting i think because it's um uh the the, the you know the undeniably just going out into nature or just a just a natural walk for an hour is un unmeasurably far better than just anything in a city i don't uh, you know they could they could i just don't believe all that they could do as many studies and peer-reviewed articles as they like but say like, yeah i'm just gonna go for a walk i feel great i don't need i don't need people to sort of try quantify this in any sense I just so I like to be near nature um and I I think anyone who says they love cities I think something's gone drastically wrong there um but I guess like small villages are my sort of in between that's not to you know anyone who's in a city I understand why you'd be in a city right it's, it's just how it is um 
but the, so the question of like relocating if you can relocate to the country then definitely do it um you know it's just it's just he head over heels better it's just calmer more peaceful um you can actually see the sky like i didn't know this for a long time and when i the one one of the few times i did go to london and spent a couple of nights there i came back and felt like i could actually breathe and didn't realize that actually the pollution is so high in these cities that you you generally the air quality is far less um yeah i mean if you if you if you want to relocate i mean the, 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 there is the question there of are you reloc relocating for the sake of like buying into that form of lifestyle which is always a it's always a question um and it is one you you'd, you'd have to sort of find for yourself unfortunately the the country is becoming quite expensive um uh, which is which is annoying and they're selling a lot of farming land and adding in all these horrible suburban estates and stuff um but a lot of it's being protected and a lot of it's left so the question of relocation is you know um i guess all right one 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 more example on this if the the classic text on like whether or not location matters is thoreau's walden right and so thoreau he moves to his cabin on the the lake uh as away from the city now people really criticize thoreau now because they realize that actually he was like two miles away from the town and his mum used to bring him food blah 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 right and i think this is a dreadful criticism because i actually think that thoreau's life was the perfect middle because he realized you can't just you can't do the ted kaczynski thing and go off in some shed and shut down all the shutters and be like the modern world doesn't exist like i don't want to know about it and then what happens planes flew over ted kaczynski's shed and he went mad like and and that was one of the reasons he cited for him doing the bombings was because he basically had shut out the modern world so completely that he pretended it didn't exist and then when these dirt bikes came past and the flame planes flew overhead he just couldn't deal with it and i think that's why thoreau is actually you shouldn't criticize thoreau's because he didn't do it to be like the modern world sucks it doesn't exist i don't want to know about it he's like i'm going to try find some way to exist in like a coherence with the modern world like you can't just deny it um and i think he did that really well um and the the whole thing of like people criticizing because his mum brought him food it's like well yeah it's his mum you know it's probably just quite a nice thing for them to do so the relocation thing it's it's uh, yeah if, if it depends it depends what you want to do just don't just don't go to cities they don't need any more food great thank you for that question nathan <laughs> um yeah. we're kind of having a debate in the chat about whether whether or not uh we like cities some of us do like cities <laughs> um but it's interesting. I think the human scale thing is critically important. Uh, and you can really tell when you're in a city that's built old, it's all, basically if it's old or not. Um, and whether or not it feels like it's human scale makes a huge difference. Um, we're losing that for sure. Amy, would you like to ask your question to James? Sure. Hi, James. Hi. I'm coming from you from New York City, very happy here. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand your perspective as well. And I was one. I was, I was thinking about how much our interior world actually needs the externalities of physical experience for us to be, become brave enough to make these perspective, perspectival changes um, that you're talking about. Because I've had this kind of what you're kind of talking about this awakening and this internal feeling of freedom that didn't come from any external changes necessarily. But do you think that there's certain physically precarious circumstances that allow us to confront our own mortal existence and break through the strictures that keep us confined in our own prisons? Meaning basically like, I don't think this is entirely a psychological process. I do think that there's something that has to happen within our physical bodies and where we place our physical bodies and how, what kind of, existential risk we put them through that allows us to kind of understand you know maybe mortality and how you can stay locked in an office forever but is that really what you want your life to be like and i was just being curious about your thoughts on that uh, yeah absolutely i mean the body the body's super important the body is basically completely ignored by the west for one reason uh if you think about it in terms of i mean think about it as sort of the rule of three of like the intellect the emotions and the body um i won't mention where i get that from because i go off on a huge tangent but the intellect the emotions and the body 
in the West, we love the intellect and we love the emotions for one primary reason. We don't have to be here right now. We don't have to deal with ourselves, right? The emotions way off in the future or way off in the past, uh, thinking about something stupid we did or really worrying about something in the future. Same with the intellect, um, completely worried about some, trying to solve some problem that's, that's coming or trying to solve some problem. Like what would I have done then if that happened, right? The body doesn't get this choice. The body has no other choice but to be present. Um, which is why it's super, super important. Because if you if you sort of want to try deal with reality more objectively, then just try uh, refocus your attention on on something to do with the body. And I do think it's it's uh, important in that sense in in relation, as you say, with mortality. And um, th th there is a there's a there's a real peculiarity of the the fear of death in the modern world. Um, and I guess it, this this always is going to differ for a lot of people because of what people may believe death is or, or comes from it. And a lot of people don't like to think about it. And of course, there's great texts on this. The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker is probably the most well-known. But um, the, 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 the funny thing that's always struck me as peculiar about the, the re our relationship with death in the modern world is that we do everything to escape death, and yet we still seem to be doing it for that for that reason right so it's like we want to ignore death but it does seem that we fill our time for the sake of not having to sit and deal with the fact that we may very well well we not may very well but we will um one day die and i don't think it's a bleak thing to to think about i think that's something that i disagree with all these people who talk about life ex extension for the very fact that i think if all these people who want to live forever well i think meaning is completely lost once you live live forever the whole point of life is you have a finite amount of time and you um dedicated to something and I'd, I'd like to say at this point i you know i'm sure i still have some amount of fear somewhere for death but i'm fairly uh, fairly fine with fine with it i mean that i think i think the problem modern world just really doesn't accept it and I, you get you do get to a point i think that's what midlife crises seem to be is that you either sort of double down on the modern world and just start going on cruises every year and you know drinking cocktails and blah 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 and like oh god like everything sucks i need to i need more pleasure of the modern world or you have the midlife crisis where you like you you have to confront something um and i think that actually the earlier you confront it the, the, the healthier you become because it seems that what a lot of what the modern world is is basically just trying to avoid death which is where i think workaholics come from is yeah, you know, and this and this new productivity culture that we've got from silicon valley where everything's has to be super like as productive as possible i just think well you know like just just deal with the fact you're alive <laughs> um yeah <laughs> i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> yeah <laughs> great uh let me see if there's any questions oh yes uh dean would you like to mute yourself and ask your question Yes. Hello. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what does your book do that Mark Fisher's work did not? That's a good. I, that's a good question. I think um, I would agree. So I guess for Mark Fisher's sort of capitalist realism, basically that acceptance, right, that the left is needed for a long time. So he he writes capitalist realism. The point of that is that most left wing people sort of come at capitalism at the point of. It, like it, as if it hasn't already won which is a really silly thing to do like it's clearly won so I th he was controversial for the fact that he said look come on we need to begin from the point that we accept that it's won and this revolution hasn't the idea of revolutions or silly and that's why he was so controversial um my what my work does which mark doesn't is give you practical advice and isn't miserable uh i you know nick land writes a thing about called the critique of transcendental miserabilism, uh, which is a critique of Fisher, which is all these people who are very miserable in spite of capitalism. And I basically do see that as an indulgence. And I think it's a, a, a way of self-justifying your own misery. Like, oh, you know, as if these people are somehow waking up and like, oh God, this sucks, man. Capitalism, like, dude, like you can't be like that all the time. I just think, and, and of course they, they, they find ways to, um, you once again it's all self-justification so what i'd say mine does is just take a complete step back because i think there really is a lot of ways to to you know it is capitalism is here to stay 
you know, I've written a lot about that as well. That it just subsumes everything into it. But there's only there's an extent to which that writing about capitalism over and over and over again and critiquing it over and over and over again is just unproductive. It's just not productive. And that's what most philosophers do these days is just rehash another criticism of capitalism without ever really having the courage to say, well, maybe we should just try something tiny on a personal scale. And they don't really want to deal with the body. They don't want to deal with experience they want to deal with intellectualizing things all over again um so what mine does that that marx doesn't i don't really consider it complete theory i think it's silly to do that and i, I do, like once again i would just say i think there is a lot of things you can do and i think it's really defeatist and and i would just repeat indulgent it's very easy to indulge in the negative emotions and basically it, you know it's the one thing people will never give up is whining about things um and i, I just think it's a it's a silly thing to think that you you wake up and um, I can't see how these people can just wake up and and uh, be in that mindset straight away. I don't. I, what I would say is, and this is like super pretentious sort of sort of thing that someone who's I don't know just dropped LSD on Facebook might say, but I don't see how you could maintain that sort of miserable attitude towards capitalism if you were just walking a nice spaniel in the woods right for an hour and i get it you've got to go back to the modern world but I, that sort of misery which you can hold i think there is escapes in life and i think if you you know if you just go like I, what i'd say to all these people who are just having these miserable bitter protests about capitalism just go for a go for a bike ride like just just step away from this highly online indulgence of misery for a second get out of these forums and go cook a meal without checking your phone every 10 minutes and i get it you're still within the beast i get it but that, that and i'm in the be i'm in the the belly of the beast as well but you don't have to keep abiding by it you can you can you can you can find these moments of freedom and the more you find them the more you learn how to develop and find out what it actually is you want from life life and one thing i would say is which is the importance of nature and the importance of getting away from cities and i'm sure there is within cities ways to get away from it and there's ways to get away from it sort of mentally as well but, you know, go for a walk, go for a bike ride without a phone. And, you know, as I say, I do, I am aware that they're very pretentious things to say. But I think the thing is, a lot of people just don't do these things and will immediately write them off as some sort of, um, I don't know, well, that's been commodified as well or something like that. And I just think, I just think it's very defeatist, very silly. Um, and one thing I like to say about capitalism, uh, which is a bit crude, but if you have to eat crap, at some point in your life it's best not to chew and i think that's what leftists are doing and all these people who critique capitalism are doing they really enjoy mulling on this thought and not just being like look just it's, it is sort of defeatist in a way or maybe they can call it defeatist they can call it accepting but what right now what what can you do and there is a lot you can do right now um that, that i know that's a bit of a non-answer but i would so the very quick answer would be that that within the book there is some sort of very simple practices which i don't think fisher would put forward for instance one would be and uh me and john michael greer joke about this a lot which is like the you know at christmas you get the animatronic small dancing santa claus toys you press the button and it dances um we make the point that if anyone in their right mind thought about these these gizmos for more than a nanosecond they wouldn't buy them but the fact is people do buy this absolute like try it crap and that the fact of that means that people aren't really thinking in their lives. They aren't really consciously dealing with life in any any sort of, I don't know, rational way, I guess. And it, it's the, the, the Fisherite perspective of capitalism basically makes it seem like it's impossible to turn off your mobile phone. Like as if that's, you've somehow been made to sit online and be bitter all day and it's like well no you the, the, I, I can't really explain it any any more simply because i just think that you meet an impasse with these people who always want to uh in, indulge in their misery basically and i don't really have i don't you know raven asked about whether or not i sort of changed uh mentally myself and you know i'm way more happy and way more content simply for the fact that I don't really affiliate or indulge in misery anymore. And it, that's a decision you can make. And a lot of people will think like if something's making them miserable, that they somehow have to get to the structure or have to deal with it. Or like, man, I've been on Twitter all day and I'm so angry. Like, well, just turn your, turn your phone off. 
turn your phone off. Don't look at the news. You, you don't have to make that decision. And they will, of course, defend that once again of saying, well, you have to keep up with the news. I've kept up with the news my entire life and it's never got, got me anything. Right? Nothing's ever changed because I knew of something going on in the news. You could say that comes from a point of privilege. Possibly. Possibly. I don't, I don't personally think so. But there you go. That would, that would be my answer. Um, I do like some of Fisher's work, but um, I'm critical in, in the, on the very practical sense that I think there is things that those people could be doing. Yeah, there's like always this huge gap between like, I have this personal problem. So therefore, therefore, I'm gonna put it all on this collective solution. Um, and I think one, one thing I would say about your answer is that there's a huge difference between these kind of temporary solutions, say like, I'm gonna use like, uh, that freedom app and just block certain websites for my phone, versus making a actual like, qualitative change like for example you hear a lot about people who like took lsd and realized how horrible their video game addiction was and they they like stared at that like time they've spent playing world of warcraft or whatever and um just never went back to it so i think the thing i would kind of give back to you is the difference between these kind of temporary solutions which could be going on a walk like going on a walk could be a kind of spiritual bypassing but it also could be some kind of like really deep spiritual, like mini ayahuasca retreat or something. So I think that there's a difference between just like covering things up versus making the deep qualitative changes. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that question. Uh, Peter, would you like to ask your question? Okay, so uh, circling back to the death anxiety uh, that's ubiquitous in modernity, how do you think this is being manifested in our society's response measures towards this pandemic? Um, man, I mean, I, I guess I'm on the, I did tweet about this. Uh, and it was probably, I guess it's one of the controversial, controversial tweets in a way. Um, that never has, you know, some people said that they did see this and I, you know, I guess I'll, um, I will front this by saying I did, I, uh, there was, there was a couple of people I lost to COVID and there was a couple of people who I really cared about who I couldn't see. So it's not like I haven't been affected by it, but, um, and some people said that they did see this perspective. I didn't see it anywhere, but the perspective for me that maybe some people are just completely fine with death and being ill and suffering is something that just wasn't addressed in the pandemic. It was immediately, oh my God, we need to avoid any semblance that there's suffering out in the world. We need to avoid death. You know, this, this is objectively, obviously awful, awful, right? And that unconscious apparent collective agreement that we all agree that death is just definitely awful because it's death. I, I'm really skeptical of it. And I think there's probably a lot of unheard voices who really were just like, well, if a biological, to be human is to err and also to be human is to basically live in a world where guess what, things can come along and just kill us. And I don't, I don't think it's really healthy to be in a world where when this happens, we immediately begin to wrap everything in cotton wool. Yeah, take some, take some precautions, but I think things are going to come along in time where people just die and people do just die um and you know the, the the response was i guess basically not that surprising that people people are very very scared of death and i don't i just don't think our relationship with death is is um is, is very healthy at all i spoke about this recently with paul kingsnorth um about how uh the the west in ireland they still have some tradition with relating to death where when someone dies the body's actually open in the family house for a while and then it's brought through the town to the um the crematorium or whatever or to where it's being buried and actually in, in england all i've ever seen really is it's just completely wrapped up you don't see of it and and you, you don't want to see it and people are um absolutely terrified of it and and for, you know for good reason because when you live in a predominantly materialist world which is secular uh death obviously is the worst thing that could ever happen because you get to stop experiencing pleasure um which is basically what the modern world's attuned to um i consider myself a christian so my relationship with death is different and and it, when it comes to death it's very difficult because as i say if you have some religious thing or you have some even a cult thing or mystical thing or if you're secular 
then it immediately changes how you approach that. Um, so it, it's always difficult to talk about it. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I, the, the response the response to it was really of no surprise that immediately, basically it's like the paradox moment again, right? They have to admit to something they don't want to admit to. Um, and how people dealt with that, I guess, came as no surprise. Great, thanks for that question and your answer. Um, we have a question from Anarch. Uh, am I on? You are on, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see, let's take up my question. It was a rather lengthy one. So I take your point about the death anxiety producing workaholics, but would you relate this in some way to the alienation and lack of meaning that people feel in their work? Let's take Graeber's bullshit jobs, for instance, and people experiencing this immediate meaning deficit in the present leverage credit and consumption to try to buy back this lost time that they're never getting back they spend at work and deferring their consumption of meaningful time into retirement, basically. So I posit there's a time value of time, in fact. Mm. And this ties into acceleration, credit accelerating time, this feeds on itself, sort of. The, the, the question of retirement is a really interesting one because um, everyone I've met who's retired, I've met because they've volunteered to come do a job because they're so bored in their retirement. There's a lot of people who, um, there's a lot of people who that probably doesn't, you know, that who, who didn't, but um, it seems to me that after years and years of working that most people basically, their identity is quite literally their job. You know, when we say to people, what do you do? People say their job, right? They're unconsciously were like, oh, he means, you know, he or she means, means my job, right? Like literally what you are is your job, which is, you know, a very, uh, it's basically a truism these days. Um, deferring meaning until retirement, I think basically retirement is is a, almost enough time to realize that they've never developed meaning in their life. And um, the lack of meaning in work and the consumption of things to try like build some meaning, I think they're all from the same structure. So that's why no one ever really gets anywhere. And basically it's just filling time and, and things like this, is, which is, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to talk about because it's the same it's the same loop in a way um and i think that there's a essay in it in the book called time sync where you know someone mentioned video games and things and, and the amount of it's always astounding to me the amount of time that people do put put into video games and things like this that it does seem to quite literally people sometimes even say it's quite common to say oh that'll fill some time which to me is basically admittance that you don't really have one you don't have any meaning in your life because if you had meaning you'd go build upon that thing and two you're completely not fine with just being yourself right because because doing something is basically a, a way to try to get away from just being right which is really really great when you when you learn how to do that when you learn how to just be be like man this is this is great um that's really cool but the whole idea of filling time is basically like, oh God, I can't, I can't stand just being on my own and in my own head and being myself for a bit. I need to like externalize my experience and just identify with something else until there's some other thing to fill my time. So these people who sort of say like, oh, work sucks, blah, blah, blah. This is, this was always my criticism of UBIs that if we brought in a universal basic income where people didn't have to work, I think you just see a mass of suicides because most people don't have meaning outside of their jobs, uh, which is unfortunate. And um, when people sort of speak of like job holidays from their jobs, they just go on to do some other form of like Western productive thing, which is nicer. So like most holidays aren't really like, a, um, aren't really, uh, I don't know, they aren't genuine relaxation. I always find, found holidays to be actually more stressful than working, but they, they're like another th way to just fill time, right? Um, I, yeah, I am... Um, I'm just trying to think of, you know, I just, it's really difficult because once you get down to the point that there's no meaning in someone's life, it's just this case of them trying to sort of just basically fill time. That's what, that what I've been saying. And, and deferring it until retirement is, is almost, it's a very depressing uh, religious myth 
of looking at the world, right? That there's some teleology and the teleology for modern man, the utopia at the end is the retirement when all your bones are creaking and you go and play bingo every night. And it's like fun, fun Island for what, 10, 15 years before you, you pass away. And I think you, you probably realize that there, there wasn't much point to it. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just one of those absurd things again. Um, um, the clock time as well is a big factor in this because it's you know i think i don't really believe in clock time it's obviously there but it just seems just silly um right some hours last as long as days and some hours are minutes long it doesn't you know the whole idea of like it's an hour i just think is completely ridiculous but no one no one ever admits to this when especially when you're in school and you're in a maths lesson which drags on for what is four hours but it's an hour and you go well they're all the same length and they're not they're obviously not that's not how time works but um yeah that I, that's not much of an answer, but um, there you go. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then we have, hi, this will be our last question. Let's see, well, okay, we have a couple. We'll, if, if that's okay, we'll go through these last three that we have in the chat. Um, Mike, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure. James, what do you think of the millennial desire to move to a ranch and live in a tiny home with a bunch of their friends and their tiny homes, which is something that uh, appeals to me too, and a lot of my friends. Do you think this could be a manifestation of latent desire to exit modernity? Is this something people are intuitively feeling on at scale? This is really tough because I, I this is a tough question because I'm a very, it's not going to surprise you. I'm a very self-involved person. I don't have many friends, not in the sense that I'm like lonely or anything. I just don't like having many friends. I think it's a load of crap that people say they've got more than like four friends. It's not possible. These people are just silly. Um, so in the sense that like, I, I want to comment on this. It's very difficult for me to do so because my own bubble is very uh, like myself. So I would say, yeah, it does seem this way. But then when I get invited to like, uh, weddings or baby showers or things um, which you can imagine for me is a complete joy um, and I see these normal people I do realize that possibly I am living in this sort of uh, uh, not dreamlike but uh, and not utopian but almost like the bubble of a modern ascetic monk of which my friends are also within and that actually the fact there is a modern world which we can all somehow define does mean that the majority of people are doing these normal these normal things right we wouldn't be in it i wouldn't be able to write an essay about the absurdity of mortgages and this credit-based society if that wasn't the norm so i'm always very cautious to say that there is a lot of people who want to do that because yeah most of my friends want to do that but equally i have to understand that my friends are much like myself are into the same things so it's it's difficult to say i mean um so the uh, I think I think it's a great idea. I mean, a lot of this, these ideas of tiny houses and moving to ranches and homesteads, a lot of people don't realise the work that would go into them. But also a lot of this relies on uh, the, the state's relationship with land because they're basically realising that they're, well, they're going to change housing into basically a subscription model, I think, where renters don't even have any rights. And you just it's basically like shelter, but for Uber or Uber, but for shelter. Um, that seems to be the way that property is going. Um, and governments have always been skeptical of this because as soon as people have paid off a bit of land there isn't really a general like income coming for the economy there and everything the justification from for 99 percent of decisions in the world today is it will be good for the economy right so basically all these decisions around covid and this really annoys me is 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 like well we're going to shut down this and you've got to do this 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 and with masks and you've got to do this and it'll be good for the economy i don't care about the economy i, I, don't, I do not give a crap about your economy i don't give a shit I don't give a shit if people are losing a bit, a few bit, a bits of money. I literally do not care about some abstract thing called the economy if everyone's quality of life is massively, massively less for a few years. It really does not matter to me. Like, why, why does that matter, right? Everyone's absolutely miserable. Everyone's uh, shut in. Everyone's got ill. Everyone's, you know, whatever, just, just generally really down. But it's fine because the economy's gone up and stayed, stayed stable so basically like the first what do you call it the first principle of society is the economy has to stay stable so 
once again, it goes back to that point of intellectualizing things and quantification. The quality, the quality of life just doesn't matter anymore. It's all to do with quantification. Are more people buying things? Is the money going up? Is the percent going up? And I think it's that's the absurdity there is that what really matters is, every, you know, oh, everyone's miserable, but it's fine because some people in the stock market somewhere, which I'll never see, uh, made like a few more percent. Cool, great. Well, I'm glad that happened. Um, but as for moving to a ranch, you know, I'd, I'd love for everyone to do it, but it's, uh, you know, the land laws. and There's a lot of practical problems around that. Um, I, I looked about buying land in, in just Wales uh, and trying to get past a load of laws for building uh, like a homestead there. And it, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. And tiny homes as well. You know, I'd, 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 I'm really behind tiny homes. I'd love to have a tiny home. But um, the, the prices of land is like, I don't know, for instance, where I live, it'd be like for a tiny home bit of land. Firstly, just to give the very practical problems. Oh, this bit of land's 100 grand. Great. Well, there goes the whole point of tiny home. <laughs> um, you know, this bit of land. Okay, you can say, oh, a bit of land, a hundred grand, and then they can build a tiny home for like 30, 40 grand. And then they'll go, ah, eh, well, you've got to pay all this money for like, um, uh, what do you call it? Planning permission. And then you're already back at square one. And then they might just say no. Um, so that there, there is a huge, there is, there's a load of problems there with tiny homes. But I do, that. my one point of optimism regarding that is I do think they're eventually going to have to bring them in because, you know, there's huge, huge, housing crises everywhere but i think they'll be brought in on that subscription model unfortunately which is uh, sickening uh but i think it's a way to uh, definitely a way to work in the mo modern world but they're very skeptical of that way of living because once again it's the whole point of uh for instance if you have a tiny home and you pay it off quite quickly and then you've just got bills and tax which for a tiny home let's say it'd be like 200 quid they they see the I think they see this as like the rising of basically like almost a new class of people that you could say like a a consumers like they're just not just not interested in that whole thing but they're equally not anti it right it's like I don't know it's a very strange group of people I think that's the group that's that's slowly growing that's very silent um and I think it needs a name I don't I I couldn't come up with a name for it. Great. Okay. Uh, Flavius, would you like to ask your question? Hi, James. Thank you. I am, you are kind of answering this <laughs> a bit, but um, it really struck me. Can you hear okay there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It really struck me near everything, what you're saying about going away, because I had COVID last year and uh, I've been having long COVID since, like it's very strong symptoms and kind of nature has been the only thing I was, I trusted like more medicine and stuff like that, but really nature has been one of the, and, and also spending like community, good time with others. That's, that's been what's been most helpful, but now I have to move because I've rented my house and I've been looking for a house and it seems so absurd, like the price of the house and what I'm getting for it when I'm, I'm thinking like, but at the same time, I have this, this, this need of being with others and, and doing something and, and, and playing with others and everyone is in the city. So I, and also this kind of trust that if something happens or at least maybe the city, you know, can help me. I don't know. Maybe it's a fantasy. And, and, and on the other hand, I'm like, okay, I could go anywhere and, or maybe co-living, but, my question is like, how how do you, as a hermit as well, I can ask that. How how, how do you how do you find community, and how do you how can you still do what you have to do when you feel like how can you get both of those things, like connectedness, but at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. nature, which is like the real, the body, the feeling, the, the concrete the world the earth instead of the world i think it's important because one of the important things is that i don't i think people shouldn't be as um not comfortable with themselves as they are i mean if you're if you're on your own and you're uncomfortable then you're in bad company right and there's a reason there's a reason for that you need to be able to deal with yourself um in terms of like how do i deal with that i mean i only really go to like one it's about finding groups which are very specific i mean i i noticed in the comment you the question you wrote do you not feel lonely in the countryside and i actually feel 
I feel loneliest when I'm in a group of people who are completely just in it. Like they're in the modern world, right? They're just in. That's when I feel lonely because I just can't really deal with it. Um, and it's almost like you're surrounded by some sort of uh, zombies or robots. It's, it's absurd. So in terms of that, um, I, 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 that's a difficult comment because I, I it took me almost the entirety of lockdown, which was like two years to basically go, oh, maybe I should like, maybe I should go see some people. You know, it took me a long time to not feel completely shut in and stuff. Um, so socialization and stuff, I, I'm, I think most people are like sort of over socialized. Uh, but but that's all all a very subjective thing. So if you're someone who needs a lot of people, I I'd find it hard to relate to that because I, I just generally don't 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 really do that all that much. I mean, I have some groups that I go to like once or twice a week, but I t- t- tend to tend to keep to myself. But I don't think that has to be some like morbid lonely thing. The idea of like the lonely man, I think, has been built by society in some sense that that's some absurd thing. I really don't think that's that's right at all. Um, you know, I do sort of call myself a hermit, but uh, no, I'm just more. I, I'm just completely, I'm completely accepted and content with the way I want to live. And um, you, I think a lot of misery. This is complete truism again, but a lot of misery comes from feeling that you have to conform to some other way of being. And a lot of people I know who socialize and uh, do these kind of things are like, I don't know, they just seem miserable in them when, when really they want to be off doing their own thing. And those own things can be really, um, I don't know, they can, they can be strange or odd or, um, you know, things that, that you wouldn't always think about doing or, uh, you know, like just going for a walk. It just seems absurd these days that you have to say that. But um, I think people would feel some compulsion that they need to be doing something when they go for a walk or need to be spending money or, you know, and it's fine to like just go sit in a park, you know, um, it seems somewhat you know you don't have to do that with someone else and talk and have a coffee and like you know do all this stuff I, it's fine to just be in the world that's the best thing to do it's the one of the most beautiful things to do um and that compulsion to feel like you need to conform to other people's standards or to status or to popularity or to like brands or things like this that's what brings about most the most misery because it takes a lot to admit you know what you know, to have that sort of underlying feeling when maybe you're in a nightclub, you know, when I had this feeling when I was probably about 19, 20, first time I was in there in like nightclubs or in clubs or out in bars. And you, you basically have a gut feeling like, you know what, I'd, I'd rather just be at home, like reading, reading a book or I don't know, or out for a walk or something like that. And I think um, most people believe that that because it's against the, the general flow of the modern world makes that some makes them some sort of outcast or stranger or weirdo. And I think just leaning into that and accepting it you know you, you become a lot happier and a lot more content um but it takes a i think it takes a while to become to become fine with that um yeah great lovely <laughs> over socialization it's probably a problem that a lot of us have especially being online um Okay, I think maybe I'll, I'll close us out with a final question. Something that caught my eye when you were speaking or my ear um, was you mentioned that you don't think that the world is disenchanted or existence is disenchanted and yet the way in which we are engaging with it still needs to be re-enchanted. Can you kind of describe that a little bit of tension there um the world itself is still enchanted in some sense which what what does that even mean and then what is it for it to be to be perceived as disenchanted in some sense because i mean i've heard a lot of people make that claim that the world has been disenchanted um so what is that and then how do we re-enchant our experience with it which i guess in some sense if it is already enchanted it's just coming into alignment with reality after being kind of in a world that's disconnected from it so that makes sense i'd love to hear Mm -hmm. your response to that yeah no it's yeah it's a really great question i think enchantment we are um in the west we're very skeptical of enchantment because it seems like a childish thing an immature thing and i don't think it is but enchantment i think can best be described as probably your childhood memories when you you your perspective allows for something more than just uh, the what you're looking at and what you're sensing to be a material uh, scenario right you know when you're Ernst Jünger calls it like stereoscopic vision as if um, 
some like veil has been laid over something so more of it comes alive and you meet these people who maybe they're enchanted in terms of history and when they look upon a woods they would their mind would sort of be able to sort of embroil it with a battle which once happened there or people who are really into nature would be able to sort of sense it in an ecological way but i think the majority of people unfortunately enchantment has gen generally been destroyed and deconstructed and uh, deconstructed in a way by the, the culture of productivity and the idea of going for a walk one's immediate thoughts would be like how long is it going to take i'm feeling a bit exhausted i could be spending my time better uh and then like discussions about work and things and not just being and you're always in this other world of the disenchanted world is one of complete quantification um it seems to be and i mean i'll perhaps i'll give you um uh, a personal example of what it means to be enchanted just from a a personal recent um experience which was uh, a few years ago i'm i'm really into the work of george gurdjieff who is a greco armenian mystic um and i was reading lots of him and about the 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 world he built in france uh, during the war and things like that and this is just amazing mystical man who really um helped a lot of people break out of uh, what it is to be a machine and blah, blah, blah. I won't go fully into this philosophy. But the Gajifian tradition, the fourth way, is, a, is an oral tradition. So it's spoken. A lot of it's been written, but you can't really get the, the truth of it unless it's oral. It's sort of passed on by osmosis, being around these people who... So, you know, Gurdjieff taught his students and then they taught their students and then those students teach us. So I got in contact with uh, a local group and so George Gurdjieff had a pupil called Kenneth Walker, and he taught someone, I'll just, uh, let's just say uh, this guy's name is Smith, so I don't reveal my location. Um, and then he teaches me. And But I remember the first time I met him was we just went for a walk locally. But when I first sort of saw him, it was obvious it was him, even though I didn't know what he looked like. And I remember this really deep feeling of having a connection way back to history, a connection to that there are still people and places and ideas out there who really couldn't care less for the modern world they really you know they're, they're doing their own thing that they're, they're trying to there's, there's, there's still people out there who are trying to find beauty and and uh you know mysticism and something more and everything we're taught from a young age makes it seem as if all those beautiful stories and scenarios from the past are simply events from history and are still no longer happening and uh, that's complete bull right that whole world is still out there and it's still happening and it's still you're still able to see the world that way but we're taught to to we're taught that it's a virtue to have this rational mindset that the world's no longer beautiful and that we understand the brutality of it all. And I think that's so silly. And I think it's just important to emphasize that that that, that there is people out there who who really couldn't care less about that now, and that that history is still happening and life is still happening and things are still being built. We're not at the end of history. It's such you know that's ridiculous. And that 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 like most things, it's just just a case of attempting to reveal them and the process really of with that starts with knowing yourself and observing yourself and admitting um admitting certain things about yourself which you might not want to admit that you might buy into things which you know you ultimately know aren't great for you and that even though deep down you know that you want to leave your job you you know there's something holding you back or you buy into something silly that you don't really want to take the risk and i think there that you know the, the, there's a whole world out there and it's completely beautiful and it's often shut off by self-imposed mental restrictions uh which can often take the form of something extremely extremely banal such as you know justifying a purchase or justifying why you have to live a certain way or you know even being scared of wearing the wrong clothes or doing things like that and just to begin i think that's what the book does in a way and the essays do is if you just begin with these smaller things these smaller presumptions you make about the world and begin to take them apart then everything begins to unfold and you realize what it actually is you want that's most wonderful it's a great place to wrap things up i think um do you have anything else you'd like to impart with us today um no i mean my, my new blog is called venture with reality dot um subscribe to hermitics podcast um i'm not really interested in money like so just just subscribe like like and subscribe that's that's fine uh other than that just thanks everyone for coming it's been a it's been a real pleasure it's been really nice
Yeah, thank you for coming. It's, it's been wonderful to hear your thoughts on exiting modernity, a question that I'm sure we're all pondering a lot right now. Um, great, wonderful. Um, okay, well, I will just let everybody know about a couple events that'll be coming up here at the STOA. We have the Dame on Nose with Bernardo Castrup on September 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have Erotic Magic in Mass Media with Mariko Loza. Um, that's on September 23rd at 12 p.m. And then we have the Philosophy of the Unabomber uh, with David Scribina on October 4th, also at 12. Uh, all interesting talks getting into some of, uh, I mean, Erotic Magic, Mass Media, Unabomber, there's a lot going on there. So I hope we can uh, see some of these faces uh, for those events in the future. And you can find all of our listed events at the stoa.ca. And with that, um, say goodbye to everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs>